and Melia, I'm very happy to have the two of you here today. Um, we are celebrating three years of Talking Harp, and we started the project by interviewing harpists and learning about their music journey. And some point um, in this project, I have kind of got the idea that it might be really interesting to start connecting harpists together and see what it looks like when they interact. So in last year, we have um, organized a, a bunch of duets amongst our guests. And this year, I thought we'll take it to the next level and do a little panel discussion. And I'm very thrilled to have the two of you in here. And uh, if you haven't watched the interview for Amelia or Nadia, check it out. You can learn about their music journey with the heart uh, in there. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is going to look at something that both of you do quite well, actually, uh, and it is composing. Now, you two are very different composers, so I'm very interested to kind of see how, as we talk, what kind of similarity is going to come up and what kind of difference might also come up in the process. Uh, but before we do that, I would like you to share a little bit uh, with us about your journey with composing. So how long have you been writing and what instrument do you primarily write for? Why don't I start with you, Nadia? Yeah, hi. First of all, um, I'm really thrilled to be here um, in this interview. It's um, a really wonderful idea. And um, yeah, so um, I've been composing um, for about 25 years now. I started uh, in 2000 when I recorded my first CD and uh, I up to then I already had yeah, some arrangements of traditional repertoire, but I thought, okay, for this CD, it would be really cool to also to have some original work. So uh, this was the main, uh, the yeah, the initial idea. Um, I think there were also some, in my opinion, some pieces missing on the CD, and I couldn't find anything um, in the repertoire that I already had. So I thought, okay, let's go and, and write it. And um, yes, I mainly write for um, for harp and for Celtic harp and uh, also for for song. I'm also a songwriter. Awesome, thank you. Melia. Yeah, I actually, like Nadia, have been composing for about 25 years as well. And I initially started composing because I was in a harp ensemble as a child and my teacher would encourage all of her students to compose. So the early years of my composing was really based on inspiration and just the styles of music I was playing at the time and how that informed the ideas that I heard in my mind. And then over the years, it's really evolved based on my collaborations and my growth as a, a harp player into my professional years. Awesome. So both of you have been writing for some time. Now let's dig into the nitty gritty of the discussion now. We'll start with a question around motivation. So, and this is a question for both of you. What motivate you to start composing? And does this motivation still resonate with you today? And maybe I'll go back to Amelia first, because you already talked about sort of how your early year has started composing. How has that changed for you, if anything? Yeah, when I was a child, composing was really motivated by my instructor or just my peers also coming up with ideas and me getting inspired by being in that young um, creative energy. And once I became an adult, I think some of my travels inspired my works. So I had a kind of a burst of composing in my early 20s when I traveled abroad and just had these new experiences that I wanted to capture in some way beyond word. And I felt song and writing on the harp really showed off what the instrument could do and spoke about my own personal experience. But then as I went through my 20s, my composing really evolved to what my collaborations wanted and what I was aiming to do in collaboration with other instrumentalists. So I had a group called Stringquake that really focused on odd meter music and world music genres. And that kind of took my composing in one direction.
And then once I went and got my classical degree, I looked at more form and how to combine my creative thought process with the form of what I was aiming for, if it was a sonata form, a rondo form, or more of a folk ABA form. Awesome. So it's really, yeah, my environment that keeps motivating and shaping. Yeah, I ideas. can really see that too. And in the different conversation that I had with you, you have always kind of talked about how an environment plays a role in shaping you know, the music that you are writing or playing. And how about you, Nadia? You are still writing music these days, a lot of times for your own uh, album and whatnot. Do you still find writing as a way to sort of fill in those gaps that you don't see in the <laughs> repertoire that you can find? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's always these new um, programs evolving. And then I think, okay, here I could use um, a piece that has exactly that energy that, that I want at that point of the program. Um, when I'm talking about like solo work, and I think my main motivation is also, um, even before I write, uh, I want to create like a, me a meaningful moment or a beautiful moment. And I want to write a piece for that. So it's like, I, I always, I have always the performance in mind when I write. Or maybe a workshop when I write for students, uh, something that is um, doable and that will inspire them. And uh, so it's all, always kind of practical. So I never, almost never sit down and write something that I think I'll never use it, by, but I'll write it down anyway. I mean, I guess nobody does that, but <laughs> I'm saying it anyway, you know. So it's always um, some, um, yeah, some, some, some purpose. Or sometimes um, people that I play with, uh, they, they tell me, could you write something in, the, in terms of, sometimes my percussionist says, could you write something more energetic? Could you write something more, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, the quietest percussionist on earth, so please um, give it a little bit more speed. So that's also motivating, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Toccata was written like that. That's yeah, awesome. that was inspired by my percussionist who said, um, please, uh, we need some more up-tempo up things here. <laughs> just said there so when you're given sort of a direction or some kind of purpose if you will be it writing for a student or hey I, we need an up-tempo piece to play together how do you continue to sort of flush out that idea so what i mean is that so for example i'm a photographer and i have this practice of kind of making up a mood board if you will to plan a photo shoot so even though i know generally what i'm doing i want to refine it a little bit how do you refine those ideas and do you have some kind of way to keep track of them or organize them um actually i find the idea of a mood board very interesting i should try that <laughs> <laughs> i haven't i haven't so far um but it's really cool um, i'm also working with a lot of visual ideas and my whole place around here is filled with colors and pictures and right. uh, photos and souvenirs so um, um but i think most of that um, my my mood board is is in my head yeah. and uh what i normally do is uh when i when I kind of need a piece, I need to write for like um, a new program or collaboration or so. Either uh, it, it always starts with improvisation. It's uh, either on the harp or um, uh, singing. It's also possible when I don't, when I travel, I don't have the harp with me. I can also sing. And then I always, uh, always capture it with audio first. And um, I also do my, my kind of archives of um, composing ideas. It's all, everything is audio. I, I tried um, some sketching uh, something down. And sometimes I look now at old sketches. I don't even know why I wrote this down because I don't understand it anymore. It's, but if I have an audio, I can, ah, yeah, this is a good, this is a really good idea. So um, I should um, pursue it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then uh, 
I go from audio to first sketches all by hand because it makes my um, it somehow triggers my creativity more than going to notation uh, software right away. So it's either pen on paper or pencil on iPad. That's the same effect. It's also writing. Mm -hmm. So and when I have this and I have a couple of ideas, um, then uh, I go to the notation software and then I go back and forth and then I have more structure. And this is my kind of my, my workflow at the moment. <laughs> and how about you, Amelia? Do you have some way to kind of collect those ideas and refine them as you start composing? Yeah, Nadia, it was helpful to hear about your process because it kind of offered reflection on my own. And I actually didn't really go to music writing software on a consistent basis till about six, seven years ago. And before that, I would compose completely by just hearing something in my head and working it out and actually playing it enough that I came up with something that I was enjoying. And essentially, the more I played it, the more comfortable became my fingertips. And at some point, I was just really happy with where I was at. And sometimes I would do voice memos because I always say, I think I'll remember something. But the fact is, the voice memo just really helps to crystallize it in a different manner. But I found, actually, when, when COVID hit, uh, a number of people asked if they could buy my sheet music. And so that was a great incentive to make sheet music. So I finally wrote down uh, the seven pieces that I'd been really playing actively for over a decade and had on my albums and that people were familiar with. And that was a really helpful process because it got me comfortable with music writing software and feeling that relationship between creative ideas and the flow to the computer. And now I very much write with the computer with me, sitting there on my harp. And sometimes I actually really want to write from what's in my mind more than what can my instrument do. I see the, my harp as a vehicle of expression, but I don't want to think about the limitations to define my ideas. So I'll hear what's in my head, I'll try it out, put it into the computer, hear out sounds, and then try playing on the harp. And I might make a few modifications. But then my process is really once I've kind of written down a section, I might come back to it the next day or a few days later and see, does it still stick? Does it still settle well with me? And if I really am enjoying what I hear, then I'll think about putting a second melody into it or kind of what it, what is my form. But I found that having a computer to write it down is really helpful just to crystallize it and not lose anything. Because as we know, we can always scratch out an idea, but we can't refine it as easily. So it's, I guess I would say it's, it's, stream, it's streamlined my creative process more, which has been really satisfying because I know the limitations of listening to a song on MIDI, but it's, it's so helpful just to keep the creative juices flowing in my mind. And do you do anything, Amelia, with those discard ideas, right? So I, in my experience, I have find it takes a lot of ideas to get to that one idea <clears throat> that you really want to hang on to. Do you ever just, you know, let the other ones go and perhaps never revisit it again? Or do, do you have a way to collect them and revisit them later? Yeah, I found I'll often just write them as versions. <clears throat> and so this, this, in some cases, I'll have the solo heart version one, two, and then by version three or four, that's the one I'll actually perform and start sharing with others. And I might come back to an earlier version later. And but even most most of the case by happen chance, like, oh, right, I had that earlier version. Oh, I like that particular idea. And I don't think I'd necessarily write a new piece based off of that, but I might integrate it into the current version of that piece based on, you know, a new perspective or an idea I have or one can always expand a work even after it's been premiered and performed for some time. So it's it's just nice to have um, kind of the solid material and then other working pieces that you can bring together at, at different moments because a piece is never really done. It's just in a form that's ready to be shared. I like that concept. How about yourself, um, Nadia? Do you find yourself doing similar things with discarded ideas? Mm, well, sometimes mm, um, I see that one idea that I was really fond of just doesn't, doesn't fit into that current composition. And um, most of them I just, I, I discard, I say, okay, it will probably 
um, it's not that great anyway, it will, or it will come back. Or, uh, but if it's something really special, um, yes, I, I also put it in the archive. Um, but then maybe under um, another t title that has nothing to do with that composition, because then I can see, okay, this is something that has nothing to do with with that work. So it can be the spark of a new one. So. Mm. And my next question, sort of along this line, is how do you define done? So Amelia kind of talked about, you know, a piece of work is is done when it's good enough to share and then she keep evolving. How about for you, Nadia? What does that look like? What do you do you put a, a definition of done around a piece of music? Or how do you define that? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I would like to quote a very um, uh, famous painter on that uh, his name is Gerhard Richter I don't know if you have heard of him he um, um, he's a German painter he must be in his 90s now he has done uh, incredible uh, photorealistic stuff and uh, he sells for millions so he's really big on the market and he, he really knows and he was asked how um, when do you know when a painting is done and then he said um, it's done when there's nothing um lame or stupid left in the picture and i thought this is so great you know because it's like you know you have this piece it's almost finished but there's this one measure it's go, it's like uh, every time you go there it's like uh, cringe uh this doesn't really sound good oh this is hmm. and then when you finally manage to make that last part that you already you are you want to finish the piece you know, like you want to start practicing it and, but you know, there's this one part that's like, always oh, like, mm. and then when you finally find a solution for that one, I think this is, as Amelia said, it's, it's always temporarily finished, but then at least it is, um, in a form that I'm happy with it, that I'm, I can stand behind it and present it. And I'm not like, oh, I hope nobody will notice that this sounds really lame in this particular place. <laughs> I really like yeah, this perspective so. because instead of chasing for perfection, which could take forever or it sometimes in some cases it never happens, you're going for a good enough to share with the world that you have you're happy with and accept that you can continue to to evolve that. Anything else you want to add to that, Amelia? I mean, I really like that that quote because over time, I think what helps me a lot also is that I go to a lot of concerts. And so I'm constantly hearing really great ideas and why they work. Like my brain's just like, oh yeah, we came back to that concept, but it was a little different. And I think uh, in my composing class at school, we were always looking at, it wasn't about having a lot of ideas, but it was having a few that returned in the piece at the right moment with a few minor adjustments if it was a note or a rhythm or something and so i think music is a story in sonic words so if you feel like you've taken the person on the journey they've made it to that peak and then they've returned home and feel content in that piece you've done a good job so by the time i've listened through one of my pieces enough i feel like i've taken the journey and i'm back home comfortable and satisfied that's kind of where I settle in and know that um, I've given the listener enough meat to chew on and they want to come back, but they also feel settled and inspired. about discussion around the idea piece before we move on to the next question. I'm very interested in kind of knowing for you, do you find any of you find ever that you're so overwhelmed with ideas that you, you get lost in a sea of ideas almost? Or do you actually find it the other way? It's actually harder to grab onto a couple of things that you want to um, uh, sort of expand on. Um, and I ask that because I have found sometimes I, I've, I would overwhelm myself with almost too many ideas and I have to really bring myself in and narrow it down. And I wonder if that happens too in music and composing. 
um, or is it just me being scatterbrained? <laughs> Maybe I'll start with you, Amelia. I oftentimes see myself going the other way, which can be challenging because I'll come up with an idea and after a few versions of it, I'm like, oh, I like this. I'm, I rarely struggle with content. It's, it's more of just like the trusting myself. Okay, I have these, you know, these 10 variations of this idea. Which one is feeling most settled as the leader? And then where can I bring the other ones in as a later kind of reflector back to that, you know, core melodic idea? And I just have to, I mean, really it's, it's trusting my ear and, and my heart, like what is, what is feeling good. Um, and I guess, yeah, I, I don't have as much of the, oh my God, all these different things are happening right now. Sometimes if I have a lot coming at once, I'll just put it all down in front of me. And so I'm not feeling like I'm grabbing for, for something or I'm going to forget it. I kind of just lay it out to calm my mind and then the more I play it through, the more I settle into it. And sooner or later, I'll be like, oh, yes, or oh, no. So I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate that it, things are pretty clear for me once they've, they've played enough in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I like that method of capturing it so you don't feel compelled to glom onto it. Yeah. How about for you, Nadia? How, how, how do you feel about wrangling your ideas? Do you ever have too many ideas, too little ideas? Mm, I think it's a little bit the same um, as the process that Amelia just described. I mean, when uh, when we're working, I think we're both really like f very focused on well, what we want to, where we want to go with that piece. And that my, um, for me, it's um, once I know what I want to say and what the piece wants, <laughs> because at the beginning, sometimes I don't know what the piece wants. It, it's going somewhere and sometimes it's also very surprising mm -hmm. and so uh, when I have some ideas um, that I'm not really sure of I put them um, like at the end of my um, notation thing I always have like I think um, as default I always have 120 bars at the end where I can put <laughs> some ideas that uh, for, for um, storage and so, and then I can look back at it, but um, I'm also very fortunate that at the moment where I'm looking for ideas, they, they usually, they come. I think it's also the mood that you're in, or um, if you're really in, in that kind of groove of the piece. I mean, and we have all heard so much music over the years. It's, it's there's this huge archive of um fragment structures that can be put together. And uh, so I think it's, it's, it's really um, our language music. So it's like writing a new story or um, this kind of thing. Yeah. And I hear that uh, from Amelia a lot too, because one of the things she loves to do is going to concert and it gives her new ideas that she can now add to her uh, brain that she can pull out perhaps later. So I, I, I resonate with what you said there. Um, a lot. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the constraint because we, we have um, the instrument that we're writing for and then there's also potentially, you know, you're writing with a specific audience in mind or you're given some parameters. So for example, in, in this project, which I have invited both of you to write a piece of music, we were looking at something that might perhaps be suitable for a late intermediate player, someone with a couple years of harp experience that is looking for a solo piece. So we're, we're kind of giving some parameters or drawing the line in the sandbox, if you will. What are your thoughts on giving yourself those constraints when you're composing? Do you find them helpful or do you find them restricting? Um, let's start with you, Nadia. Uh, yeah, pretty helpful. Um, whereas in the end, I'm always, uh, I think my last um, phase of going through a composition then is always um, simplifying or adding a little extra to to make it adjust to to that level that we agreed on but um, it's uh, I must admit I sometimes um, I, I struggle a little bit with uh, judging what is the right level for and so maybe sometimes things are too easy or too um, most of the time probably too difficult and um, so yeah <laughs> what I found 
found interesting so, is well, a I think when it, when we think about difficulty level, it's so subjective. What is easy for someone might be difficult for someone else. Um, but I think what I I found very um, in a way hopeful is that people are kind of letting go of those constraints and they just write down or create things that feels good or sound good for them. And I think in many ways there is there's a lot of uh, credit for doing that. I think if we're just constantly trying to tailor to a certain audience or or put too many parameters, we might miss out on some good ideas. Um, does that resonate with you, Amelia? Do you agree that, uh, like, what are your thoughts on the, the parameters? Do you give yourself a lot of parameters? Or do you find them helpful? This was a good challenge because I didn't really let the level hold me back. I would have moments that I'd ask myself, oh, should I simplify or not? But what I always think is, if a piece feels too hard for someone, they can slow it down a little bit. And so I, I often see speed as an indicator of, okay, I'm a more advanced or comfortable player in these particular shapes or phrases, so I'm just going to take this instead of that 120, I'm going to take it at 100. And that way, instead of simplifying my phrases and almost simplifying the music, uh, I give them more time to achieve it. And that's... Um, really one helpful way to feel like you're not having to lose our harmonic idea or a phrase that's so satisfying in your fingers and ears kind of idea. But yeah, I thought the parameters were a really fun challenge because I have never really thought within that framework. It's more of what's in my mind and how it then translates to the page. So it's really nice to have um, a purpose for this particular composition and a reason to start composing again. Yeah. yeah like that and and i i think it's a really good way to reframe that you know if you cannot do it at a certain speed or at that difficulty you can always take it a step back or slow it down i like that um because i think a lot of times not even on composing but like as a uh, harp learner when we look at the sheet music sometimes our initial feeling is we look at all the dots on the paper and we go there's no way <laughs> there's no way i can do this and that can be self-limiting for us too right as learners and what you just shared there i think it's, it's great and and you're right i i really resonate with you know not compromising a harmonic idea that is so good uh, at the end there so i really love what you shared okay um and i'm going to continue with you, Amelia, on this question. You have a lot of solo work that you turn into chamber ensembles. How does that feel like for you when you're taking something that you have created and then you have to recreate it in some other shape or form? Yeah, I currently I oftentimes don't actually change the heart part, but I really just add some um, more harmony to it or more. I think about it as adding more nuance to a conversation. So the heart part is there, but all of a sudden, you know, as a single instrument, there's so much you can do, but then there's things that you just cannot do. So I love writing for chamber groups because it enables people to hear the harp, but in a different light and bring out other voices that the harp may be introducing, but may not be as prominent just with the solo instrument. So I see it more as a mixture of arranging and composing a new layer, because in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, what, what's the definition of arranging? It has a variety of definitions, but when I think of it, it's more of adding more development oftentimes in the left hand, or maybe instead of just having a single line in the right hand, more harmonies. But here I'm doing a mixture of that, as well as just adding more of a robust sound, depending on you know what I'm writing for. And to be clear, usually my chamber group arrangements are for trio, because I find that uh, three voices really meld well and I'll often have either, I've oftentimes stuck with cello as the, as the low bass voice and energy because you know you can have it as a bass but you can also have, have it as harmony or melody as you see fit. And then I've worked with brass, woodwinds or, or other bowed stringed instruments. That's fun and um, I, I really enjoy what you said about sort of expanding, adding to the harp and so the harp it's always still sort of that centerpiece, if you will, in the piece there, for sure. And Nadia, you compose primarily for the harp, on the harp, and Celtic harp, uh, which involves little levers. Have you ever had to sort of 
put aside some ideas because it doesn't just fit with the instrument that you're using? Has that ever been a problem for you? Uh, yeah, of course. There's um, a pile of ideas um, that I can only do on a paddle harp. It's, uh, so <laughs> it's uh, where I try to make it work with levers preset in different octaves, but it's in the end, it's like, no, it's never going to work. So um, I, I'll have to do that on the pedal harp or even on another instrument. So, um, I mean, we're talking about uh, restrictions of the lever harp here, obviously. So uh, sometimes um, another restriction is in the, in the like low mid range. It's it's kind of hard to get a really uh, precise sound uh, without a lot of buzzing. Uh, I am also looking at that. Is it? Uh, I mean, something that would sound great, like on the piano or on a um, on a cello or um, like any lower um, woodwind instruments. It, it's because they can have this really precise pop 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 sound, and the harp would just go, and it's all muffled. All you have to dampen without end, and and so and and so. I I also look at is it really is this playable, and um, maybe in the past. <laughs> I haven't looked at that so much, but then um, uh, when you do recordings and you see, okay, you have a lot of strings buzzing here, have a lot of noise, then you think, okay, maybe I should rethink my composing strategies for the future in that particular range. I mean, at the top, it's no problem, but especially mid middle, low middle bass, you have to know what sounds good on the instrument, what, what's working and what's not working. Right. Now, both of you write harp solos, but also songs that is accompanied by a harp. Do you find the process of writing a song, right, which include words and whatnot, uh, a lot different than just writing a harp solo piece? Um, would that start with you, Nadia? Well, obviously, you, you need a single melody. <laughs> Um, but I, no, I don't find it so different. Um, I always see the harp accompaniments is like, um, as like a second voice. It's like they're singing in a, in a duet. So it's never just an accompaniment. And, um, sometimes they're, um, composed, like you could also, also play them this harp part, uh, for itself. It doesn't need the, the vocal melody. So not always, of course, but, um. I like the idea of of, uh, of counter melodies and really like sing, singing in duet. That's actually what, what I do, singing in duet with the with harp. So it, no, it's not so not so different, mm -hmm. not at all. Now, now that you put it in those words, I, I can see that in both your songs and also your arrangements. Because um, so one thing I really enjoy about playing your arrangement is the, the interactions between the two hands. You don't generally just have the left hand in a very simple accompaniment. There's a conversation going on between the two. Oh, know, which I very lovely. yeah. Yeah. How about you? Yes, Mary? I think. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, ju I just wanted to add one thing. I, I think uh, it do it just doesn't uh, do the harp justice in song accompaniment if it's just okay. doing um, the triads and arpeggios. It's it's so it's there can be done so much more. So that's mainly why I do it. Yeah. Uh, and, and like I said, I really see that in, in your music, which I really appreciate. So thank you for adding that. All hail to the days that married more praise than all of the rest of the year. And welcome the nights that doubly How about you, Amelia? Do you find writing songs and a solo piece very different in terms of how you go about it? I think the primary difference is how I view the role of the harp. And I think because I haven't focused as much over the years on writing song, there have been eras I've done it, but it hasn't been a core part of my voice as a musician. Uh, I haven't developed or evolved to see the harp as an accompaniment or a conversation. And it uh, it's still, 
I imagine the more I'd explore it, the more I'd find more of a meaningful interaction between the two. But when I'm writing for harp, it really, it is the voice. And it's really looking to show the full capacity of the instrument within a certain, from a certain angle. And when I'm writing words, it, from my experience, it's often been what, what is the mood and feeling that I'm wanting to convey based on the words and the melody that's happening? And how can the harp be that role? And then of course, I'll often have a harp specific moment to bring out the instrument. But I'm still very much exploring that. You know, we we define how we want to see something really. And there might be norms and stereotypes within the world of how song and harp work together. But I'm still I'm very much in the early stages or another evolution of exploring what that relationship uh what I want that relationship to be for me as a performer. Now let's switch gear and talk a little bit about process. We already touched on that uh, earlier, uh, but let's stick into that a little bit deeper. Um, Nadia, when you think about workflow and tools and all of that, what comes to your mind? What are some of the things that sort of you you personally use to uh, help um, note down all the different things that is happening as you're composing? Share some of that with us. I use um, uh, music notation software that is called Muse Score. I use that because um, it's uh, a lot of people that I work with also use it. So it's easy to share files and um, it's also very simple. And it, uh, I, I like to work with it. It's uh, a great thing, but there are also other great things on the market, of course. Um, and um, for writing um, the ideas down, well, either um, I, I used to do a lot of pen and paper, but now it's like um, tablet and, and pencil. So uh, it's, uh, it's a lot easier and um, better to make um, corrections, adjustments. So th these are my main, so I have this, this audio device that I used to record um, notation and um, tablet. And uh, I have to add that uh, I think it's very important that the audio device that you uh, or for me, it's important um, that you capture the ideas uh, has a certain quality because then it's, if you l listen back to the things, I have a, a little stereo recorder and it makes the heart sound nice. Uh, and it's because if you just use the, the lowest thing, then you listen back to the ideas and if everything sounds horrible, then you're your creativity doesn't just doesn't want to kick in or mine it's it's like oh this this sounds horrible why would you want to expand this idea so if i already have something that sounds reasonably good then i'm more um happy to continue to work with it so this is um what i what i mostly use as my my tools that is such an interesting piece of insight uh because you're right like if you look back at the idea and it's not doesn't even sound attractive you probably are yeah, going right. to be as likely to go back to it isn't it why would anyone else want to listen to that yeah <laughs> exactly yeah for sure how about you Amelia what are some of the tools you use in your composition yeah I mean like Nadia I found MuseScore very helpful I also um I used to years ago use Sibelius but now I use Finale more for chromatic music where I have to make a lot of lever shift recommendations. But when it's just writing out a piece, I find Muse score is so intuitive. And, you know, the easier it is to put down an idea, the more it works with your creative workflow. And we all know how it feels when you're having all these ideas in your mind, you just like can't quite get them down on the paper in the way you want to or on the software. And we, we hate we hate blocks, essentially. So I really enjoy music where I can just like literally tap in, okay, D, E, F, G, A. Oh, I hear that and I hear how it sounds and then letting, letting that flow happen. And in terms of recording, you're right. You want to have a good sound. I probably could, I mean, one could always have a better sound, right? I just use my phone often. I often find also that making sure I play it in the way that feels good for me in my ears and then I record that because if I have it at the wrong tempo, it can feel sluggish and I'll be too quick to judge. Or, um, you know, it's like, how do you how do you capture an idea in a way that you'll wanna come back to it and revisit it versus, oh, there must be something better out there, right? So uh, 
yeah, I think it's I think it's a combination. Mostly now I just put it into into MuseScore and then I can come back to it. And I like Nadia and how you mentioned earlier that you have you know like a hundred measures at the end of the piece where you store ideas. Because <laughs> no, it's great because I'm I'm of this philosophy sometimes that I'll literally just change it to version two and like get rid of whole sections and if it feels good to remove sections because then it's this idea that it's like I'm trusting in what's coming next or evolving of, an, of a stronger, more uh, fluid idea. But I mean, every given day you feel something a little bit different. You know, you might hear, hear a piece in a performance and come back to an old idea and realize, oh, wow, that was really helpful. So I think MuseScore or any software writing device is really just such a helpful tool to keep track of listen back to and have easy um, access to, to motion of, of ideas. So you can kind of rearrange things because oftentimes it might be that you have a section that just needs to be removed, but sometimes it's like you have a section that's great, but it's just in the wrong place. And so that ease of, of you know, take something, move it over a little bit, take the other piece, slide it back, and all of a sudden it's like, voila, there it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we should add for someone who is new to music notation software that there is the ability you write the music down, but then you can also, uh, there's a MIDI being created, so you can also listen to what you have. So, and this is also, this is the helpful thing also for us, I think, um, because then we can, um, when we record ourselves, uh, we're always, okay, um, concentrated on that. But when we write something uh, and just lean back and listen and we can really have it sink in. And uh, also like uh, you can change the tempo, you can uh, transpose and and uh, so it, it's really helpful. It's, it's a great, it's a great tool. And one, one other piece to add is that you can also change the dynamics because I think sometimes you might have an idea, but because for some reason the sound of brass is or violin is very, very forte in a lot of softwares, you find that you can't really hear the harp or all of a sudden you don't like an idea because it just sounds kind of robotic. Mm -hmm. And I often will uh, play with dynamics just to get a sense for, are these harmonies working? Or like, for example, if you use pizzicato for a, an instrument, you might not hear it because the harp, you know, is louder or there's a violin playing over it. So it's really trusting the experimentation of using the software to your advantage. Because there's always limitations to not actually hearing it on an instrument. But how can you use the software options to, to also answer questions that you may not be able to answer yet otherwise? Very interesting insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you have a very uh, predictable process or workflow that you generally follow as you compose? Or are you more uh, in the moment spontaneous? Why don't we start with you, Nadia? Um, uh, I think uh, the process that I have described earlier, um, this is pretty much what I feel comfortable with now. Mm. It's um, where I feel um, that I'm getting the best results because I have kind of everything sorted out and um, I mean like the technical stuff the, and then I can just let the ideas um, come and, and flow and I know I'm ready for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me somehow um, I'm sometimes a very um, maybe even over structured person. <laughs> this is this is very helpful. It is, when the ideas come, I'm I'm ready and I can um, and then I also I do what to do with them next. Because it's one thing to have a, an idea. And then totally different thing to make it into a piece. Because uh, you have to be organized somehow to um, I mean, if you just play it, um, as Amelia said earlier, um, a lot of times, and then it forms in your playing. This is, uh, this is great. Yeah. And, um, uh, but also, um, if you, uh, if you know, okay, I can today, I, I got so far and then tomorrow I will work from here. And so this gives me a lot of, um, calmness somehow that I can trust in the process and I kind of know what I'm doing right. in all this, you know, sometimes randomness that composing also is. Yeah, I think it's great to have a structure that 
you can lean on so that you can focus your energy in the things that perhaps you have less control over. I think it's what I'm hearing because mm -hmm. sometimes ideas and whatnot can can be quite random, and you want to have a system in place that you're ready to yeah. receive them. Right? How about you, Amelia? Yeah, as you've brought to my attention, I think I'm rather spontaneous. I call it highly organized and an intentional spontaneity because I kind of feel like the ideas flow from somewhere else and I'll like sit down at my computer and I'm like, okay, it's time to compose the next thing and I'll just start listening and it'll start happening and then I'll get to that point where I'm like, okay, no more ideas are really flowing or I'm not having as much fun at the moment. I'm going to take a break. And later in the evening, I might come back and the inspiration might be flowing again. It's more tapping into the intuition of when I'm ready to do something. And then, of course, deadlines are, are very helpful uh, in terms of, okay, I'm going to write this. I want to write this piece in the next couple weeks. And I never really doubt whether I have ideas. It's a matter of what, you know, intention setting. What is the goal for this particular piece? And level, obviously very helpful. Time frame, very helpful. And then the rest really takes care of itself. And I, I've gotten better over the years not pushing myself to be creative when it's not occurring because it happens regularly enough to create the material that I'm wanting to for the programs I'm presenting. So, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting process to reflect on because we all have different ways of, of creating, creating the stuff that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, so on that note, when you're creating, we're going to talk about sort of how our minds and body works in, in when composing. How do you feel? Do you, is there a physical manifestation in you when you're composing? Is there some kind of a sign, if you will, that the body is telling you as, as you're composing that, yeah, this is the moment? And, and how does it connect to uh, your mind and, and getting those ideas out? Do you feel something physical as you're writing? Let's start with you, Amelia. Yeah, I definitely, you know, you have those moments where you're playing around with chords or a harmony and either it's like, oh, that sounds so satisfying or oh, not quite it. And the beauty of putting it into a software is you're looking from a different perspective. You're not thinking about technique and getting all the notes and all the levers in the right place. You're just looking for music's sake and an idea's sake. But either way, I definitely have those, oh, this is really flowing moments. Or then, okay, I think I've said this idea, you know, as I, as I often describe composing, it's like writing a good paragraph. Where's your comma? Where's your period? Have I put them both in the right place? Am I ready for the next idea? So yeah, usually I like it when it doesn't feel good because I then have more confidence when it does. So you do yeah. kind of take those little <laughs> body cues and into Yeah, right? like, okay, this is just not... I, I also think about if... Assuming my audience has never heard this instrument before, what do I want to leave them with? And that can help, you know... We need to have the fl flurry and excitement to then really appreciate the long, quiet harmonies. And so as, I, as I'm composing it, it, I can feel... I just feel where, where the right right moments happen. How about you, Nadia? Do, do you have sort of a, a physical sort of manifestation to you as you're composing that you feel like this is going right or now this is not quite? How does it feel for you when you're composing? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, um, <clears throat> as uh, I think every uh, creative person, I, uh, I think when it's not going well, it can be really um, almost uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's also it's it's hard work, and then you you try to to get something right, or you you try to um, manifest an idea, and if that isn't really happening, and and you doubt, and uh, you think is this really the right idea to start off with, and so this kind of um, in between. Uh, you, you have already started, but the process hasn't really started. But then once uh, you're in the flow or you uh, you really got it and you know you're onto something, it, it can be absolutely um, exciting and uh, in, even like exhilarating. So when you, you're in the middle of it and you know it goes well and you have these ideas and, oh, there's something, oh, I have to put this here. It's, um, I think it's, it's a, a feeling of, uh, for me, it's uh, of, of great freedom. 
because somehow you can uh, create this thing that wasn't there before. Uh, it's almost like, you know, you're, you're growing a garden or something like in half an hour, you know, yeah, yes, let's have this tree here. Boom. Let's have this grass in and here's a little river. And you can just, you know, with almost nothing, just rhythm and notes, you can create this landscape. And it's, and this is really a great thing when it happens. It's, um, yeah, it's not so often. Sometimes you struggle, you know, but now and then <laughs> there are these moments of, wow, this is, I, I love this. It's really yeah. a great moment. And what do you do when you do feel those moments of struggles or like if you have a right of rock, do you, how, how do you deal with it? Um, well, uh, when I have uh, no idea to start with, um, then I usually go to back to improvising. Mm -hmm. um, I believe very much in that you have to invite your brain to take part in it. And if the brain knows that there's not going to be any fun in this at all, it's not going to co cooperate. It wants to go outside and play. <laughs> so um, now we can just say, okay, we're just going to play a little bit around here and uh, see what this instrument can do and uh, how to make it shine. Also what Amelia said earlier, you know, you want to bring out the best in our instrument. So what sounds good here? So this is when you have nothing to start with and you're, you struggle. So improv improvisation is always good. And when you struggle in the middle of the process, um, I, I like to do a good mix of trying to get as far as I can and then cleaning up in the middle, you know, then doing other things like, okay, then I'm going to make my sheet music really neat. Maybe I'm going to cut off some of these 160 bars at the end that I really don't need, you know, like, like these really, and kind of going with a, with a dust thing through, you know, um, tidying up. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's minor things, but it's, um, like, okay, I'm still working here. I'm, I'm, but I don't force myself it, now you have to have a great idea or something like that. Um, but, but sometimes it's, it, it also, I, I dismiss pieces and, um, let them rest for a couple of months because, uh, I just, it, uh, I just don't, uh, get anywhere with them. So it, it also happens or the, I have, uh, other things to do, or it's, uh, it's just too hard. And then after a couple of months, I come back and say, okay, uh, I now I have a different perspective and I look back. So it's, uh, as Emilia said, forcing yourself is no. now not good. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> how about yeah. you, Amelia? How do you deal with your right of box? Yeah, I wanted to piggyback on Nadia's comment about sometimes you just need to clean up the music or do something else. And I think as creatives and as, as performers where you're constantly practicing, Sometimes you just need a break where you're able to achieve small goals and see them happen because your brain needs that space between the the exploring and uncertainty as well as a little bit of structure. Like, okay, I'm going to organize this one page for this moment or clarify these other pieces that I can do in 10 minutes. And now I'm going to go back to try, try this again. And once you clear out your mind a little bit and you give it the space, it will give you the creativity that's in it. So really trusting that, I think the flow of how it works. And uh, yeah, I kind of, at this point, I've come to just trust that I'll have enough creativity to do the work that I wanna be doing. So if it's not happening, give it a break. And it's also nice because I balance between practice and then composing. So, I'll, you know, have a practice session, be like, okay, now it's time to go and work on this piece. And then because I've been on my instrument hearing what I've been hearing, it's easier to notice what is or isn't working. Uh, and I probably have, you know, I've had my seasons of being frustrated or going back to a piece that you wrote a long time ago. And I have done reworking of pieces where I've just had to be really open to the fact that I did my best where I was at that moment. And now I have some new, new ideas to work in. But in general, I, I'm pretty much at peace with, okay, this is not happening right now, or this idea I think is okay, or I have just no ideas to present. Um, but I've been pretty fortunate in general with having 
pretty good intuition when the flow is there, so I don't have to push or frustrate myself. And I find a lot of times that uh, we don't want to do something because our little voice inside us is telling us we either we're not good enough or we're not ready. So how do you deal with your inner critics when it comes to composing? If you hear little voices that tell you that no, this is not what I'm, I can do, or I don't have the right skill to do, or for the audience out there who will have that little voice in them, what is your suggestions and thoughts on how to deal with our inner critics? Nadia, let's start with you. Um, I think um, both um, Amelia and I, we have the advantage of having over 20 years behind us of knowing, okay, this, yeah, trusting ourselves. Um, but of course, um, I mean, I still have inner critics, but then I, I know how to face them. I can say, okay, um, I hear them. What they normally say is, oh, blah, blah, blah. This is all the same. Uh, you're serious about repeating this part three times. This is so boring, you know, blah, 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 <laughs> what they always say. And, um, then I, but I, I can say, okay, uh, listen, <laughs> this is work in progress and I'm just going to write it down now as a kind of placeholder. And, um, I'm going to come back and either think of something completely different or make variations. If this is the problem, like it's too repetitive or something. And, um, um, to make myself clear that, that it is work in progress. And that not everything has to be perfect the moment I write down the first note. It's, it's not, uh, I think, uh, well, maybe one, some compositions of some composers are, are one takes or one, one writes. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, normally, I mean, I, I don't even um, receive these ideas in the order that they then turn up in the, in the piece. Like, mm -hmm. I have to, to look, uh, okay, this could be a good ending and this is a, the main theme or this is, but, um, it's, it's all at in the beginning. Sometimes it's, it's very chaotic. And so you have to keep calm and say, okay, it, it will, it will eventually make sense and it will eventually get into a good order that it's, um, it makes sense to listen to. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's the inner critics, but of course they, they are there. Yeah. <laughs> and what I'm hearing a lot from you is you, you're really leaning into that, trusting the process, just believe that it will make sense at the end. So that seems to be a big theme for you. How about you, Amelia? How do you deal with your inner critics? You know, I also rely heavily on peers, thoughts and advice. So oftentimes I'll go through you know, a couple rounds, and if I'm doubting that repeat, or I just feel like I've heard this idea too much, to know whether it's I've heard this idea too much because I've played the song 50 times in the process of writing it, or if it really needs to be something different, I'll just get a second opinion. And, you know, after years of experience of going through the process, you kind of become familiar with the little voices. And... I think oftentimes, more than even in the composing process, in the performing of the premiere, that's where those inner critics are like, oh no, I think this is too many times thing. But the truth is, I just have to, I just have to trust because in general, what I doubt is just the mind being overactive or going places that are not helpful. And so I just have to remember that it's not reality, really. And sometimes I get a second opinion and then I find either, you know, that voice did have something to say, but I generally just look for patterns and let those, those patterns kind of guide me in terms of, okay, this is the inner critic that comes out at this point in the process just to make me really have to wrestle with certain questions that I haven't wanted to address or uh, invite me to think a little differently this time because we all have styles of writing. And it's like, do we want to step outside the style or not for this moment? So it's an ongoing process, but I think as long as I don't let the energy that the inner critic take away from the creative process, I think I'm pretty okay. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hearing from you is you, you're very much someone that enjoys a dialogue, be it having a sounding board 
outside of yourself that you can go to or you're sort of talking within yourself with that little voice and that dialogue seems to be very helpful in keeping you moving forward um so very interesting strategy as well now tell us a little bit about the piece that you wrote for us amelia um reflecting on that process and um how did how did the uh, final piece uh, take shape? Um, and what can you tell us about this piece of music that you have created in this project? So when we were asked to write something for an intermediate player, three to five minutes, I really wanted to approach it with a sense of a form in mind, just to get my wheels turning. So initially I was gonna do a rondo form and have an A section, B, come back to A, et cetera, et cetera. So it flowed out of me relatively comfortably but then I had a sounding board and I found that certain sections just didn't make as much sense or I was putting into Muse score and what I liked when I was hearing was, you know, in the fingers wasn't as technically enjoyable. So I kept kind of modifying here or there and, and I really was able to let the piece kind of write itself a bit, but have that form as initial um, motivator to know where I was wanting to go and knowing what to focus on. So it wasn't just you know throwing paint at the wall and hoping it would stick, but more like okay, I have a red and I'm gonna keep wanting to see red, and then I might want to put in you know green and then yellow and then a surprise black or whatever. And then as I put them together, I found that you know one section was fine, but it, it didn't motivate you to want to get to the peak. So I kind of removed it and then. As I spoke about earlier about, you know, you come back to an idea, but you want the audience to know that you're returning, but to give them something new to hold on to so they're still engaged. So I had a lot of fun having this A theme come back and each time, you know, changing a few notes or changing the rhythm or by the end, just jumping around with different keys and being like, oh, and the lover harp can also do this if you want to. So I think it's exciting because uh, I find with lover harp repertoire, you have like more beginner, intermediate, vaguely, and then a lot of advanced. And so it was fun to think about writing for an intermediate player to show, you know, what you can do on lover harp. And that was the process that just kept unfolding. And new score was really helpful because I just kept playing it through, playing it through, revisit, take something out, remove something completely, then play it a couple more times. And by the end, I think my ultimate happiness was when I play it through now and I don't feel like I'm missing something or I don't have any moments of boredom per se in playing it. It's more like, oh this is it. oh yeah this section's coming back but I'm doing something a little bit different. So I think for my process it was important to have a structure to start me out so I didn't feel like I was just throwing things as I said. But then have for me using um, use score and playing the file consistently enough in the different sections to feel the flow before I really started putting it into my fingers because I needed to make sure the lever shifts worked but I really wanted to f be satisfied as a listener and an audience member versus just the visceral joy of playing the notes. Thank you for telling us about the process of writing the song. Nadia, how about yourself? Tell us a little bit about the piece that you wrote for us and thinking about the process. What are some of the things that really jumped out for you? Yeah, it, uh, it still doesn't have a name. <laughs> so I still... That's okay. We will find it very yeah. soon. Yeah, very soon. The initial ideas came out really, really quickly, like all in, in one go and also some very inspiring recordings. So I thought, oh, I'm this is going to be easy, <laughs> it's going to be done really, really soon. But um, I wanted to, uh, the first ideas were uh, very rhythmic. And um, I also wanted it to be, because I, I knew it would then be shared here and also on your channel, I had something fun to play. Maybe also rhythmically a little bit out of my comfort zone, what I wouldn't do normally. Uh, but then I struggled a little bit because I had different uh, rhythms in different parts and uh, also some um, 5 over 4 which sounded somehow good and were fun but then I thought, I, um, I'm doing a lot of dancing at the moment so I thought, uh, yeah, but um, well, how about just for once uh, writing something that you could dance to you know, that's, it's not like uh, you stepping over your own beat every time this four, five over four <laughs> happens. And so um, it took me um, 
a little bit of effort to get these uh, melody lines that had more notes than a 4 over 4 to work and, and that it still uh, sounded um, logical somehow. And then at some point when I thought, does this make sense at all? And, and I was really doubting and the inner critics were like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and then I took the whole piece into my, my door, my music recording um, software. I played some percussion along with it and even some uh, some drummers. You know, you can do this all uh, with fills and everything. It's it's really great. And so I listened to it. What would it in a, like a, a rock version? What would it sound like? And uh, so just to get a different perspective and to re-invite the fun. Yeah, it was uh, quite a journey, but I'm I'm really happy now with the outcome. Yeah, happy to share it. what I'm hearing here is that there's really no sort of one path that one gets on to creating anything really and I think um, sometimes there's a lot of sort of you know myth around composing be it either it's like completely like pure magic it just you know witchcraft almost you just have it and you just it just happens or then there's maybe some people that are on the other end of the spectrum that are sort of looking for that formula it's like teach me what i need to do i'm gonna follow those 20 steps and then bam i'm gonna you know output a piece of music and what i'm hearing today is it's more um there's a lot of in between that needs to happen and that could look very different from person to person. Um, Amelia, what do you think about that comment? Does that does that resonate with you? Yeah, I was even thinking, you know, we're speaking specifically about this work that we composed um, for Talking Harps anniversary, but every, every time you go to write a new piece, you kind of have a different intention in mind. And so your process might vary slightly, but like Nadia and both have, I have had so much experience composing, we tend to still fall into certain ways of coming up with ideas and, and trusting that process. So there are, you know, similar themes and patterns, but then slightly different ways of connecting and approaching each, each round. Mm -hmm. How about you, Nadia? What do you think about uh, what I just said there? Mm, yeah, I think um, everybody who wants to give it a try, <laughs> um, yes, to be um, be prepared to be surprised by yourself. I think that this is it. Listen to uh, what might uh, come up, and um, of course, there's these 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 tools and these uh, workflows. Um, but ultimately, you have to find your own workflow, and um, I think. Um, one of the most important things, if you um, if you want to try, how does the magic work? Will it will it work with me? It's a, or um, can I do it? I mean, that's ulti ultimately the question. Is um, uh, go for it, uh, start, uh, try it, but then also um, listen to what you wrote. You know, and um, not just write something to write some to fill three pages, you know, but then listen to it and, and see, okay, um, this does this tell a story? Is this meaningful? Does it move me in any way? You know, and then maybe you say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's good. Okay. Um, and then you can play it for other people, or maybe you can say, it doesn't really move me. And, and then you can start working. Why doesn't it move me? How can it, can this, get better you know and this is i think this is kind of part of the wizardry to um to go into that kind of inner dialogue yeah to really to really listen to what, what you to what you want to tell and uh what you wrote yeah thank you don't forget to check out the sheet music because when we were conceptualizing the piece, uh, one of the intentions is to have pieces that are accessible to 
folks are in that sort of late intermediate level. And I invite you to get the sheet music and give it a try. Um, and I cannot tell you how interesting this process has been for me, because growing up from sort of that classical background, the people that wrote the music I played are all dead. <laughs> There's no way for me to kind of get a little glimpse into what happened when they create those music. And obviously, you know, at some point, everyone sort of everyone that composed music the music become a legacy that we look back to and it will not we will not have that opportunity to ask these questions again but what went on in your mind when you compose and whatnot so i found it incredibly uh honored to have actually that this ability to talk to living composers and kind of get into their head a little bit to understand what goes on when they create these music that we love and enjoy and my biggest takeaway from these conversations, because um, we have numerous uh, leading up to today, is that we have to kind of lean into our own intuition, uh, listening to sort of our own head, what our head is telling us, what our body is telling us, and trusting that we can get it done. Um, and and also, I'm also hearing that uh, sometimes having someone to collaborate with, be it, you know, uh, a colleague that you can talk to, or even just someone that you can have a little bit of conversation with could be a very interesting way to kind of get things rolling. And I point it out because I find a lot of times if I have a dialogue with myself, I, I will probably be dissuading myself to try something. But if I talk to someone else that has a different perspective, I'm more uh, likely to give something a go. So I think from that perspective, like I have not really dabbled into composition yet. I think that hopefully this conversation is going to give me a little bit of confidence in giving it a go. I don't have to share it with the world. I just have to uh, give it a go and, and make myself happy in the process. So if you're an audience that's thinking about, oh, should I just start composing? I'm going to go back to what Nadia have shared, start improvising. That could be a really great starting point too. You, we don't have to go straight into composing. We can just be noodling and playing around and that can still be very satisfactory um, so I, I really like that and then Amelia too I really like what you said about getting that inference from your peer and 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 sort of doing things together that togetherness um, again going back to that energy of having someone else who can give you that little nudge could could do a lot of magic so I'm really enjoying um, what you have shared today about composing. Thank you so much. And I hope the two of you are going to continue to create more music for us. And uh, thank you so much for coming here. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, Victoria, for having us. Yeah, it was such a, such a pleasure to reflect both with you and together in this process. It's, it's something that's, that's unique and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Yes, me too. Already um, reflecting on it before we had this talk today, it's like uh, a great opportunity because sometimes we just do our things and don't give it much thought. And so this is, has been really helpful as well. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you.